On Tuesday, September 6, 2022, a three-day rescue operation would conclude on the tallest active volcano in Eurasia named Kluchevska Sopka. Twelve climbers had attempted to scale the slopes nearly a week prior, but the events of the expedition would be anything but normal, and the conclusion of the climb would lead to a year-long investigation that led to criminal charges being raised against a mountaineering company. It is one of Russia's deadliest mountaineering tragedies ever. But what really happened on the volcano, and what could cause criminal charges to be raised against a company that organized the expedition? This is their story. On the far east of Russia lies a peninsula called the Kamchatka Krai region. Under the Soviet area, the Kamchatka region was classified as top secret, but recently the region is opening up to more tourists, revealing its beauty. The peninsula is surrounded by the Sea of Ahoksk on its left side and the Bering Sea on its right. While the region is known for its production of fruits such as caviar, it is most famous for its seismic activity. There are over 160 volcanoes in the region but many of them are currently dormant. Of the 160, 28 to 36 are active, which is enough to make the region a UNESCO World Heritage Area. This means it is a protected area that has significance to our planet because of its seismic and volcanic activity. The volcanoes have impacted the region so much that it is represented in its flag and considered sacred by its indigenous communities. It is no surprise with all the volcanoes that earthquakes are common in the area. In fact, as I am writing this story, there has already been another just off the coast on August 29th. Russian media says a volcano has erupted following a seven magnitude earthquake that struck off Russia's coast. A 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck off Russia's east coast, triggering the eruption of the Shivaluch volcano, the quake's epicenter. While most of the earthquakes occur miles away from land, one of the most dangerous consequences of these shifts is tsunamis. In 1959, a magnitude 8 earthquake would strike the region, not only causing damages across the peninsula, but also sending a tsunami halfway across the globe to the U.S. coast. Since the area has been open to the public, it has become very popular for tourists who are interested in sightseeing, hiking, or more personal favorite, bathing in the hot springs. There are many nature reserves scattered throughout the peninsula, and because of the moderate weather near the coast, it is a popular area year-round. As you travel inward, the winters become harsher and the summers hotter. But this has not stopped climbers who look to scale the various volcanoes. Out of the 160 volcanoes in the Kamchatka Peninsula, the tallest of them all is Kluchevska Sopka. It is actually not only the tallest in the region, but all of Eurasia, standing at approximately 4,750 meters or 15,584 feet. I say approximately because the actual height of the volcano shifts slightly each year. Kluchevska Sopka is a symmetrical cone that towers over the region. Because of this, it has become one of the most popular climbing sites in the entire peninsula, but this climb has no lack of danger. The volcano is a top crater, meaning the most intense eruptions come from the very top, producing powerful explosions, lava flows, and ash clouds. Since the 1700s, Kluchevska has erupted more than 50 times, and it has been erupting periodically every five to six years on average. Some of its recent eruptions include December 2020, November 2022, and June 2023. The route to ascend the volcano runs along its northwestern slope. The path is known to be one of its most treacherous as it winds through volcanic rock, ice, and snow. The route begins at an altitude of 800 meters, but base camp would be established within a volcanologist's hut at 1,435 meters. From there, climbers would scale the slope, winding their way through the snow, ice, and rock to Camp 1 at 2,000 meters, then another volcanologist's hut at 3,300 meters, and finally the summit at 4,750 meters. Another factor in the climb is the many crevasses that litter the route. This is why climbers scale the 35 degree slope tied together with a rope and using anchors. This is an important detail that plays a part in all expeditions in this region. This technique is used due to the fact that if one climber were to slip and fall down the slope, the remaining climbers can attempt to brace the impact and stop the fall by using their anchors combined with their own body weight. If this does not work, there is always a last ditch effort where a climber would desperately swing their ice axe into the slope, hopefully lodging their tool deep enough to cause their body and thus the body of others to stop sliding. 
Because of the height of the volcano at nearly 5,000 meters, climbers typically complete acclimatization climbs to prepare for the summit. This means they would scale to a particular height and stay there for a few hours or a night before descending back to base camp then repeat this process at a higher altitude each time, before the final summit push is attempted. This can prepare your body for the higher altitudes where there is less oxygen in the air and hopefully delay or prevent high altitude sickness, where severe cases can lead to death. The closer you get to the summit of Kluchevska Sopka, the more difficult the climb becomes, not only from the altitude, slope, and ice, but also because of the weather. Because the volcano is still active, there is volcanic ash and gases in the air, which can cause drastic weather changes, but more importantly, it makes it impossible for rescue helicopters to fly near the summit. This means, as the climb continues to get more difficult, climbers move further and further away from help. On Tuesday, August 30th, 2022, an expedition would begin on Kluchevska. Extreme Time Adventure had advertised the expedition for many months across social media, and 10 climbers from across the country had signed up for the trip. Two guides would be leading the expedition, but everyone was a stranger to one another. They would all be meeting for the first time at the foot of the volcano. Andrei Machenko, one of the two guides, was an extremely fit person who had spent his early career as a train driver on the railroad, but after he tried mountain climbing, he fell in love. He would eventually leave the railroad, instead becoming a mountain guide. Andre had climbed the Kluchevska volcano 13 times before this expedition, meaning he was more experienced than most guides. His bio on the Extreme Time Adventure stated, When Andre starts talking, everyone listens. His stories make you fall in love with the mountains and occasionally give food for thought. Andre first traveled to the mountains in 2001 while doing military service in the Caucasus, and later they became an important part of his life. He has been working as a guide and mountaineering instructor in our team for more than five years in the Alta region. Ivan Alabugin, the other guide, began his mountaineering career while still in high school and was by all accounts capable of leading an expedition on the volcano. Additionally, his bio on Extreme Time Adventure would state, Ivan has been in our team for more than eight years. An experienced instructor for mountaineering programs, he has conducted successful Baluka Massif traverses for commercial groups. This is unique experience. Ivan also leads treks of varying difficulty in Nepal, Turkey, the Crimea, and around Lake Bacal. The group was registered with the Russian Ministry of Emergency Situations, as was required to make the climb. Typically, all climbers are required to be citizens of Russia or have a visa and permits if not, because the volcano borders a top-secret military zone. The first mistake of the expedition was that Extreme Time Adventure, owned by Andrei Stepanov, had failed to acquire permits for the climb even after applying a year earlier. Instead, he still organized the expedition as the 10 climbers had paid roughly a total of 11,100 US dollars to make the trip. The first few days of the expedition were spent organizing and preparing to summit the peak. The group of 12 had acclimatized for the climb, but the process had been rushed, mainly because many members had bought cheap airline tickets back home and were on a specific time frame. The group would have to finish the expedition before September 9th. The slopes of the volcano were extremely icy and compact, meaning the conditions were more difficult to climb rather than soft snow, and one fall could be disastrous. Anastasia Yushachova and Roman Avirin, two climbers on the expedition, would struggle against the steep slope and fall behind on the acclimatization trips as their bodies were having a more difficult time adjusting to the altitude. The guides noticed this, but did not prevent the two from continuing as they had already paid. The first four days of the expedition would come and go, and everything would be as you expect. The group would make slow progress up the slopes, but were still on their planned schedule, so the guides did not feel worried. It would take four days of coordination and climbing before reaching the volcanologist's hut at 3,300 meters, where they would rest before making the final push to the summit. On the morning of September 3rd, 2022, 
the expedition would kick off by leaving the hut at 3,300 meters. The first 700 meters went according to schedule, but at nearly 4,000 meters, climbers Anastasia Yusachova and Roman Aviren began doubting their abilities to make the summit. Both climbers were in the beginning stages of high altitude sickness and would make the decision to turn around for their own safety. One of the guides, Ivan Alabugin, would accompany the duo, eventually leading them back to camp at 3,300 meters, where they would rest before attempting to descend further. While the three climbers began their descent, the remaining nine would continue climbing towards the summit. But there was one crucial error. Because one of the guides would have to descend the mountain, this left the remaining eight climbers being led by Andrei Mashinkov, tying themselves together. This was in case one of the climbers were to slip and fall. This technique is best reserved for small groups, but because there was only one guide, they were now all linked together. The group would continue like this without realizing they just made a crucial error. And to top it all off, the group had failed to belay, meaning they were all connected to a rope that was not anchored into the rock or snow. Should someone slip and fall, this could drag the entire group down with them. Since they were not anchored into the slope, the only way to stop a slide would be if someone could dig their ice axe deep enough into the snow. But remember, the group was nine members. This would be simply too large and nearly impossible for one person to stop the slide. Andrei Machenko, the guide who did not descend the mountain, would be leading the group of nine toward the summit. The weather was calm, but he noticed the subtle signs that there was a storm coming, and the group needed to reach the top and begin the descent before late afternoon to avoid it. It had been a few hours since his fellow guide Ivan and the two other climbers had left the group at 4,000 meters to descend the peak. The remaining eight climbers Andrei was leading were all in good spirits. They were eager to reach the top. Just 500 meters away, at 4,200 meters, Andre was making his way through an icy area when he heard something behind him. At first, he wasn't sure what it was, but he felt a pull at his waist, and as the rope attached to him began to tighten, he instantly recognized what had happened. Someone had slipped. One of the expedition members had slipped down a crevasse falling nearly 30 meters to a group of rocks below, but this fall started a chain reaction and moments later Andre would be falling as well. For a second, he had no control of his body anymore, a terrifying thought when you are 4,200 meters high. Then Andre would feel a sharp pain in his leg before finally coming to a stop. It took him a second to digest what had happened, but he quickly realized that someone had slipped, then two had fallen, then another group, until they all slid down the slope. They couldn't have picked a worse spot to do it at either, as there was a group of rocks below that would provide no break from the fall. Andre, feeling pain in his leg, would look down to see that it was clearly broken at an odd angle. But it only took him a few seconds to realize the lack of noise he was hearing, or should I say, didn't hear. It would be minutes before he could assess the scene. He slowly crawled his way following the rope where he would find that seven climbers were unresponsive. What he didn't know is that five climbers had died instantly in the fall, and another would stand no chance from their injuries and pass shortly after discovery. One more climber was unconscious, but still breathing. Andre, barely able to move, could only do one thing, pull out his satellite phone and radio down to Ivan to let him know an accident had occurred. After Ivan learned what had happened, he would immediately radio for help from the Russian authorities, then begin preparations to ascend back up the mountain. He would pack additional sleeping bags, a tent, and first aid equipment, then begin the several hour climb to the fall area. A few hours after the accident, the worst case scenario would play out. A snowstorm would begin near the summit, with temperatures at 7 degrees Fahrenheit and wind speeds of 15 to 20 meters per second. The combination of bad weather and location made it impossible for a rescue helicopter to evacuate the surviving climbers. Additionally, the ground rescue team could make little progress because of the heavy snow and volcanic ash falling off the volcano, eventually forcing them to set up camp at 1,400 meters. They would need at least another two days of climbing before reaching the group. After the ground rescue failed to make significant progress, a helicopter would attempt to scale the mountain as high as possible in the late afternoon. They managed to reach 1,600 meters, but would fail to climb any higher due to the conditions. The helicopter would then drop a rescue team onto the volcano before turning back these climbers would quickly begin making their way towards the summit. 
Over the next few hours, both rescue groups and Ivan attempted to progress on the volcano, but only Ivan found success climbing through heavy snowfall and low visibility. Andre would be waiting in the fall area. He had tried to hunker himself and the others down as best as possible to protect from the weather, but their thin tent hardly provided any shelter and definitely would not keep them warm. It was late afternoon when they saw a familiar face approaching them from afar. It was Ivan. He had reached them. And for the first time in hours, Andre had hope. As the sun set on September 3rd, both rescue teams set camp and hunkered down for the night. The temperature continued to drop, and the group of four huddled into a thin tent trying to stay warm. But it was to no avail. During the night, two more climbers would fight for their lives, but ultimately pass away due to the extreme conditions, leaving only Ivan and Andre. But with Andre's broken leg, the duo could do little but try to keep each other warm and try to survive the night. In the early hours of the morning on Sunday, September 4th, Andre, the final member from the original nine that had attempted to reach the summit, passed away due to the weather conditions and his own critical health. Ivan had stayed with Andre until his final moments. The entire time, he kept his spirits high and tried to provide him comfort. After Andre passed away, Ivan made the decision that he would descend the peak back to the volcanologist's hut at 3,300 meters. There was nothing left for him under the summit except for the bodies of his fellow climbers. Ivan spent most of the day descending from 4,200 meters back to 3,300 meters, where the other two climbers, Anastasia and Roman, were waiting for him, anxious to hear what had happened further up on the peak. Within the hut, the trio had plenty of supplies and fuel to last them until the weather began to subside. September 5th would come and go, and the three climbers would stay hunkered down within the hut while snowfall continued around them. On September 5th, reports that an accident became public, but there were no specifics or names released. Rescuers on the peak would make the following statement, at the moment, search and rescue operation is being complicated by several factors. Weather conditions, ash clouds on the slopes, rock falls, as well as ice fields on the way that can only be scaled using crampons and ice axes. The wind speeds were as strong as 15 meters per second, and snowfall would be expected to continue through most of the day. But there was finally some good news. The storm was expected to begin subsiding later in the day. On September 6th, the weather began to finally subside and a rescue helicopter was finally able to make its way up to 3,300 meters where the three climbers were. Anastasia Yusachovov, Roman Avirin, and Ivan Alabugin were mentally exhausted. Additionally, Ivan had frostbite on his face, feet, and hands, while Anastasia and Roman were physically in good condition. The following footage you are seeing on screen is from the actual rescue on Kluchevska. The bodies of the nine deceased climbers would begin to be evacuated from the peak the following day, September 7th. One of the biggest failures after the accident was the release of information or should I say lack of information released by the Ministry of Emergency Situations. Each family member of the 12 climbers would be anxiously waiting for days, as there was no word or concrete evidence on who had passed away in the accident and who had survived. A criminal investigation of extreme time adventure would be launched a few days after the tragedy. Andrei Stepanov would be arrested and taken into custody for two months while the offices of the company were searched and officials began piecing a timeline together. The footage you are seeing on screen is from that actual arrest. The officials would also file charges against Ivan Alabugin the guide who survived the tragedy, and both men would be accused of manslaughter for the deaths of the following nine climbers. 26-year-old Andrei Kiprianov, 28-year-old Yukaterina Kasuk, 31-year-old Alexander Zhilovacic, 34-year-old Andrei Guter, 34-year-old Maxim Solovyov, 38-year-old Pavel Selvanichev, 38-year-old Evgeny Sorokin, 41-year-old Andrei Mashenko, and 46-year-old Igor Mihailovsky. 
The case against Extreme Time Adventure came down to the preparation and experience of the guides who were hired to lead the expedition. In today's mountaineering climate, it can be easy to obtain a certification to guide on certain peaks, but that doesn't necessarily qualify a person to lead an expedition. The prosecution would bring in mountaineering experts to comb the evidence of the entire expedition, and many came back with the following conclusions. Although both guides had experience on peaks and even that particular volcano, there were a lot of mistakes made that should have never happened. Number one was improper preparation. The entire acclimatization process was rushed from the beginning, and this was because many of the members had already purchased flights back home. Number two was a failure to plan around the weather. The slopes were extremely icy, making it more difficult to climb. Combine that with inexperienced mountaineers and bad weather expected near the summit, the group should have turned around. But the most egregious mistake, which many consider to be the fatal mistake, falls on the individual who decided to rope all nine members together and failed to belay the group. Many experts claim that this mistake was criminal because the entire group would tragically pass after one climber slipped when it could have all been avoided. After the fall, there was almost no chance of survival due to the remoteness of the volcano and the inability of the rescue operation to take place. The only person who was actually officially certified, the owner of the company, Andrei Stepanov, and he was never even on the peak. In November of 2023, nearly a year after the accident, Stepanov would be found guilty of poor safety standards that resulted in the death of more than two persons through negligence and he was sentenced to four years in prison. This was an extremely controversial ruling within the mountaineering community. The tragedy that happened on the mountain not only ended the lives of nine, but it changed the lives of so many more. Many believe that Stepanov was found guilty in an attempt to prevent future accidents like the 2022 one from occurring again. There are many companies popping up promising the same thing Extreme Time Adventure did, and many of them are employing guides without proper certification. While there are some who are confident the guides on that volcano were more than qualified, there are equally as many mountaineers who think the 2022 Kulichevska tragedy won't be the last one. Let me know in the comments below if you think that court's ruling was completely justified or unfair. Thank you for watching. Until next time.